and I call the meeting of the Senate Elections Committee to order. Uh, we have a quorum. So we, uh, we have a busy day today here, we have, but we only have one bill on the agenda, and that's uh, Senate File 3, authored by Senator Bolden. And uh, we, uh, we just want to say that we're going to adopt the, you know, typically you adopt the, um, the author's amendment, and uh, that's, that's adopted without uh, question. And then we'll hear from Senator Bolden and testifiers. And we want to make sure that we get through. We have a lot of testifiers, so I'm hoping that we can get through smoothly. And then we go on to uh, member questions. So uh, Mr. Uh, let's. Chair, Mr. Chair, before you move forward, could I, could I just uh, Senator Grant. ask or, or make a comment? So um, just for, I mean, the, the process, I know it's busy. You're busy. We're all busy. Um, but when you think about what happened in the last you know, few hours or a few, you know, last 12 hours. Um, we received a, a delete all amendment, which at 6.15 yesterday, or 6.25, 7.57, 11 3 a.m. today. And within four hours of the standing committee time. And so in our in order for transparency for all of our, right, everybody in the, in the audience, everybody in this committee, to have our due diligence and to do our jobs effectively, uh, well, we see this is your, your I believe, your, one of your primary elections bills. Is, is there, can we, can we at least trim this up a little bit or be a little bit more disciplined in getting this to us a little bit sooner so the public has an opportunity to review it um, before we come to committee? We are all busy and our four schedules are very busy. Um, it's not just a matter of convenience. It, it's just to bring, it's an obligation for us, I think, for everybody to, to make sure that we bring these things forward in a timely manner. So for our testifiers, right, if they haven't received it, do they know what they're testifying on and what changes? It appears to be some significant changes. So we just request that respect of everybody who shows up and attends and those watching remotely, that we have the opportunity to, uh, to get this information in a timely manner. Thank uh, you, Senator, Mr. Chair. Senator Cran, you're, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, and I think uh, as far as what I'm aware of is that the author's amendment was something that was being worked on and had uh, a change most recent and um, and I believe that in fact maybe council can help us with that that amendment uh, that uh, it was deleting something so it's making it actually easier if you would have looked at the original bill uh, you would understand what the bill still is less one part of it so maybe yeah. council can can help yeah th thank you mr. chair and I mean we, we agree but the the fluidity of the movement right we all have multiple obligations and for the public and so you know I'd like to quote one of our former uh, former colleagues Senator Kent right I think her quote was it's not a matter of convenience for us and or our staff it's a matter of our obligation to the people of Minnesota without adequate notice the public cannot meaningful participate meaningfully participate and they can't prepare so we'd like to be able to do that as we move forward thank you Thank you. Um, we, we do need to make sure that you do recognize that an author's amendment isn't required to be shared. Amendments are not required. We, we do have that, uh, uh, whatever we call it, the ambush uh, um, policy here. So uh, maybe uh, Senate Council could uh, describe what the well, difference is. Well, aren't we going to? It's with the, the author's amendment, between what was original and the author's amendment. Yeah. A simple, simple description. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, the difference between the, the author's amendment that went out last, the second one that went out last night and this morning was uh, there were changes to articles two and three that de deleted the democracy dollar section, so you won't see those in the author's amendment. Um, and then there were some other changes throughout that I can flag when we get to the point of the bill walkthrough, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council. Uh, and so let's let's get started with uh, Senator Bolden. You move the author's amendment. Uh, Senator Westland moves the. Or, no, you're on the committee, so you can you can move your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the A32 to put the bill in the shape in which I would like it to be heard. Thank you. Senator Bolden moves the author's amendment. Uh, all uh, su um, all supporters, uh, please say aye. Aye. And if there's negative, please say no. With that, the author's amendment is adopted. Senator Bolton. 
Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. I am grateful to be here this afternoon to present Senate File 3. This is a comprehensive democracy bill that defends, strengthens, and modernizes Minnesota's best traditions of voter participation, of sound elections administration and trusted local elections officials, of transparency in government, and of grassroots campaigns with voter and local donor support. This package of common sense solutions rests on the premise that our state works best when Minnesotans' voices are at the center of our democracy. All Minnesotans benefit, black, brown, indigenous, white, metro, greater Minnesota, rich and poor, Democrats, Republicans, independent, and those with no party at all. We all benefit when Minnesota voters, not corporations or national forces, are at the center of our democratic process. We've certainly seen our democracy tested in the last few years. We've seen a rising climate of disinformation and rhetoric and fears of intimidation. Threats and intimidation of voters and elections officials has been on the rise across the country. And we just passed the two-year anniversary of the deadly insurrection and attack on our capital. The dangerous consequences of the rise of disinformation and harassment targeting our elections. This last election also highlighted problems Minnesotans have been asking the legislature to tackle for years. Ever more money in our elections, dominated by more big donors and outside spending. Since Citizens United a decade ago, there has been an explosion of spending by outside groups, by independent expenditures that are not accountable to the voters or the candidates, or in many cases, <clears throat> voters and candidates may not even know who's funding them. Here in Minnesota, our disclosure laws have not kept pace. In fact, followthemoney.org currently gives Minnesota an F for disclosure of outside spending. This bill responds to the urgent and the overdue with reforms to make our system more accessible to Minnesotans in three main ways. First, it defends voters and strengthens the freedom to vote for Minnesotans. It strengthens the, vote, the right to vote with policies that would modernize and expand voter registration with secure automatic voter registration and allow 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register so they are on the rolls when they turn 18. It restores the right to vote for Minnesota, Minnesotan citizens living in our communities on parole or probation. And it ensures equitable access to opportunities to vote, early, absentee, and in person. With these provisions in place, our dedicated elections officials will have the tools and resources they need to ensure that every eligible Minnesotan can confidently cast their ballot and vote in safe, secure, and smooth elections. Second, it protects Minnesota voters and our democratic institutions. It includes a strong provision to protect voters, election officials, and election volunteers from intimidation and harassment. It also provides Minnesota voters in the instructions and support they need to vote in the language that they need it. And the third thing this bill does is that it empowers Minnesota voters, not corporations, in our elections. It closes dark money loopholes and increases transparency, as well as prohibits foreign influenced corporations from spending money in our elections. So in closing, Mr. Chair, this is a critical moment in our democracy. When democracy was squarely on the ballot in 2022, Minnesotans of every race, generation, region, and background turned out not to just cast their vote, but to protect it. Voters send a powerful message. They reject extremism and efforts to undermine our democracy, and they want us to take action to protect democracy and ensure that all people have a say in the decisions that impact their lives. So I'm proud to bring this comprehensive legislation that will protect and strengthen the freedom to vote amplify the power of Minnesotans by reducing the influence of dark money and corporations in our politics, and ensure that our democracy is fair, inclusive, and responds to the needs of Minnesotans across the state. We've seen our democracy tested, and there are challenges to be sure. But in Minnesota, we've come together to tackle big challenges before, and I can't think of a more important effort in starting this session than working together on this common sense, these common sense reforms to defend and strengthen democracy so that Minnesotans and Minnesota voters and our communities are at the center. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I um, will next ask that Senate Council uh, do the walkthrough of the bill and then uh, would welcome testifiers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bolton. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, as I walk through, I will make, the, make note of the changes from the bill as it was introduced um, as compared to the A32 amendment. Um, and I'll try to keep it high level so we can keep things moving, but I'm happy to answer questions about differences as we move through. So starting with section one, that is having to do um, with, it's a conforming change to the automatic voter registration data. Uh, it's in the Data Practices Act, making a cross-reference to how that data will be treated. Section two comes from um, a bill we heard in Senate File 26 about restoring the right to vote to people that have been convicted of felonies that are no longer incarcerated. There are some changes to this section to reflect the amendment the committee adopted when the other bill was heard in the committee. Section three is the first of a series of sections relating to pre-registration of voters. And what that means is 16 and 17 year olds will be able to submit a voter registration application if they're otherwise eligible, um, but they won't actually be registered to vote until they turn 18. Section four is a conforming change to pre-registration. Uh, section five is sort of the substantive um, work on how pre-registration will work and what that can happen. Uh, Section six is the first of a series of sections related to permanent absentee voting. Right now, voters can be on a list of permanent, to receive an, a permanent list to receive absentee ballot applications. And the change here is that instead of receiving the application, they apply once and then will continually receive absentee ballots. Um, Senator Rest, question for right Mr. Chairman, now. Chairman, are you, are you going to allow questions during the presentation? I think we'll wait with questions until the. I have a lot. Okay, just waiting. All right, please hold them. Council, Seneca. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, additionally, in section six, this has to do with the voter registration application. There are a couple of changes in here having to do with permanent checking a box to join the permanent absentee voter list. Uh, there's a conforming change about pre registration and a conforming change about um, voting restoration for people who have been convicted of a felony. Section seven is the voter public information list. And the change here is that individuals that have pre-registered do not appear on that public information list until um, they are registered to vote or they have a voting history. Section eight is the section having to do with automatic voter registration. And there are several changes ranging from technical to substantive in the section. Um, so for the sake of time, I won't point out all of, all of them, but I'm happy to go through later if anybody wants a great detail in this. Um, one of the main changes is how um, DHS will, well, I'll come back to that. So the idea is if you submit a driver's license or state ID card or an application for Minnesota Care or some other um, applications for services from a state agency and you show proof of citizenship, that application can be used, um, submitted to the Secretary of State and then the county auditor to be processed as a voter registration application. Um, subdivision two allows for an option to decline. So when you, when a person applies, submits an application, they're notified that they can decline the voter registration. Um, there's a paragraph that you won't see in the bill that was deleted that had to do with updating registrations and that was deleted um, because that, that process is already taken care of in current law. Subdivision three has to do with the Department of Public Safety uh, and how that process works. The current law is sort of an opt-in system. When you get your driver's license or state ID, you can check a box and they'll submit your voter registration. Um, this is sort of the opposite, that if you apply for um, a driver's license and you show proof of citizenship, so that's your um, real ID or your enhanced driver's license that gets that data, they can use that application um, to submit to the Secretary of State as a voter registration application. Um, there are some changes further down about when the system can come into place and it requires that the commissioner and the Secretary of State have determined that that system is accurate, that it can provide the data, um, and, ex and that it can exclude transmission of data on individuals who have not shown citizenship. Subdivision four is um, related to the Department of Human Services and it's a similar process for applications submitted to them. The main change here is that it's separated out um, Minnesota CARES uh, and Medicaid, which is also, which is called medical assistance in Minnesota. There's some new language in here that says if the federal government permits the state to use medical assistance data for voter registration, um, then the agency can do that. Otherwise, um, it's only applications for Minnesota CARE. 
Um, and then subdivision five allows other, uh, requires the governor to look at other agencies that can use um, their applications to be used as voter registration applications. One of the changes here is that um, an agency can't start verifying citizenship just for the purposes of using voter uh, using their applications as voter registration applications. Uh, subdivision six is the registration. Um, this subdivision was um, sort of reworked and rewritten, so there's some significant differences here. The process here is the Secretary of State receives the applications and reviews them to determine if the person is eligible to vote. Um, and that's cross-checking with some of the lists that they receive about people that are incarcerated or have had their rights um, revoked otherwise. Sorry, pages are out of order. Um, and so applicants who are eligible to vote or appear to be eligible to vote are then forwarded on to the county auditor for their voter registration application to be processed in the same manner as other voter registration applications. Um, there was a subdivision seven in the introduced bill that was deleted and that was merged with an earlier subdivision about the notification of um, declining registration. Subdivision seven in the amendment um, talks about um, if a person is inadvertently registered by the state, it, um, they can't be prosecuted for that mistake. Uh, and section eight is the effective date of registration and that is 20 days after um, the registration will be effective 20 days after the date that the county auditor processes the application unless they decline. Section nine uh, is a, another um, automatic voter registration provision um, talking about the duties of state agencies. Section 10 requires the Secretary of State to put together a single source of information about people who have been convicted of a crime and their voting rights. Section 11 is new in the amendment. And this is a conforming change that allow that makes another uh, change to the permanent absentee voter list. Um, and I will note that the permanent absentee voter list have an effective date of June 1st, 2024, and that's a new change for all of these sections. Section 12 um, specifies that the absentee, permanent absentee voting process doesn't apply to mail jurisdictions that do their elections completely by mail. Uh, section 13 is another um, conforming change for the absentee, permanent absentee voting. Section 14 also relates to permanent absentee voting and it has to do with the timeline of delivering ballots. Um, there's a change there um, specifying that um, for special elections held with a different timeline, so essentially legislative elections that are held during session, there isn't a 46 day period because it's significantly condensed, so in those cases you have to send out the ballots as soon as practicable. And then there's timelines for the other types of elections. Section 15 is a new section in the amendment. It requires the Secretary of State to maintain a list of permanent absentee voters and the, this list is available in the same manner as the public information list is available. Uh, section 16 has to do with absentee ballot boards. So when they're reviewing absentee ballot envelopes, they can make sure that the voter's name and address on the envelope are the same as it is on the voting record instead of um, just on the application. Section 17 is a new section in the amendment, but not a new section to the committee. This comes from Senate file uh, 26, which was the restoration to vote bill. Uh, the same for section 18 that has to do um, with uh, restoring the right to vote. There was a section that was deleted from the bill about transitioning voter registration applications um, because when the pieces were all put together, uh, it turns out that they couldn't use the old applications uh, to, and meet all the new requirements, so that transition was deleted. Uh, sections 19 and 20 are from Senate File 26, and that's the restoration of the right to vote, um, and the changes in the bill match what was done to that bill in committee. Uh, section 21 is new in the amendment, but also comes from Senate File 26 about restoring the right to vote. Article two is a, um, has to do with a variety of sort of election um, activities. So section one is requires um, voting instructions and sample ballots to be in languages other than English in certain situations. Um, and in cases where there's a large population also requires a multilingual election judge. Uh, the changes in this section 
um, are that in the bill as it was introduced, it was based on school district areas, and now the amendment has it based on census tracts when you're trying to figure out the, the population in the area. And then also moving from having multilingual election judges to actually moving to having an interpreter on site instead of having the election judge fill that role. Section two of the section article um, provides several provisions related to intimidation and interference. So prohibiting people from a variety of activities that fall under the umbrella of intimidating or interfering with people um, that are either voting themselves or attempting to vote or helping other people to do so. Um, it prohibits certain deceptive practices within 60 days of an election. Uh, it prohibits, um, sorry, there, it allows for vicarious liability if somebody is assisting somebody else to do one of the things that's prohibited by this. Section two, uh, sorry, excuse me, section three um, is a, the remedies provision for this. So there are both civil and criminal penalties here and section three is a, um, allows the campaign finance board to um, work on some of these issues. Article three, as I mentioned before, one of the major changes was um, the bill as introduced had a democracy dollars program for campaign finance, um, and those sections were all deleted here. Um, so section one has to do with how expressly advocating is defined and adds additional um, languages beyond the current magic words definition. Um, section, let's see. And then there are um, civil and criminal penalties as well. Um, would help if I had my pages in order. I apologize, members of the committee. Uh, section two has to do with uh, conforming change to a future section relating to foreign influenced corporations. Section three is a foreign influenced corporation, the first of the sections. You'll, there are several definitions here that are new, um, including chief executive officer, foreign influenced corporation, and foreign investor. The formatting um, of how this section is put together has changed a little bit, um, and some of the words, have, you know, owner has been changed to investor, but otherwise this, this section is largely the same between the two. Um, section four, um, prohibits foreign influenced corporations from taking a variety of activities, including making expenditures or contributions um, to candidates or committees. And uh, it also prohibits sort of the pass through type of contribution where a foreign influenced corporation can't give money to another person with the intent that it be made uh, a contribution. Um, section five is another uh, provision related to the foreign influenced corporation. Uh, about certification, so when a foreign influenced uh, corporation makes a donation, uh, well, they're not supposed to make donations, but if, if a corporation makes a donation at the time that they weren't a foreign influenced corporation, but then becomes one, they have to make a statement that their donations um, were made at a time when they were uh, acceptable. There's some uh, new language at the end of that section about um, how do you determine um, the timing and, and what corporations are subject to this. Section six is a conforming change um, in the penalty provision to reference the new um, changes on foreign influence corporations. And that will take us through the end of the amendment. Thank you, Ms. Dinkle. Um, we have many testifiers, so I, what we're going to do is go to the testifiers so that we can. Mr. Chairman, aren't we going to be allowed to ask questions? Uh, we're, I'd like you to reserve your questions until the testifiers have, have uh, testified. We have many that have uh, come some distance, and so we want to be sure to get through those before we go into the member questions. Okay. Thank you, Senator Brest. Um, uh, Senator Bolton, your first testifier is the Secretary of State, I, I presume. So Secretary of State Simon, please uh, come to the, to the testifier table. And I want to make sure that everyone realizes that uh, we have a, a sign-up sheet there. So when you testify, please sign up on the sign-up sheet. And uh, for the testifiers that uh, are not um, 
our elected officials, we're going to limit it to, uh, for the other testifiers, we're going to limit it to three minutes each, and we have a timer. So, And what I'll do is I'll put my hand up to uh, signal to halt when you see that, then wrap up your testimony. We won't, we'll try not to interrupt, but, but Secretary Simon, uh, this does not apply to you. So. Okay, well, I'll be close too, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Secretary Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, Senator Bolden, too, for coming forward with this bill. There's a lot in Senate File 3 that I think will strengthen Minnesota's voting systems and increase access for voters. I'm certainly not going to talk about all of them. I just want to really focus on a few. Uh, sure. Is this better? Close to your mouth. Yes, that's Great. much better. Thank okay. You. Thank you, members. I was saying I'm not going to comment on everything that's in the bill, but only really focus on a few items. The first one is automatic voter registration, which I should start out by saying is really somewhat of a, a misnomer. There's nothing particularly automatic about it. Human beings, actual flesh and blood human beings, will still, still do the filtering and screening and sorting of people, just like we do today. So our 87 county partners will do a lot of that work. They'll still do the, still do the reviewing and the processing. And the registrations will still go through the same state and federally required checks and screens that we do right now. That's a key point to automatic voter registration. It expands the pool of registrations, but all the safeguards to our current processes remain. Uh, it's a cost-saving measure. I think it could allow us to add or update, update up to 450,000 people, additional registrations each year. And what that means practically, members, is that it's really going to cut down drastically on same day or election day voter registration. Now, I know that's been the object of some controversy. There are members, no doubt, in this room and others who have their doubts about same day or election day registration. If that's the case, then this is the bill for you, because it will probably seriously cut by 80, maybe 90 percent the rate of same day or election day registration. Why? Because people will already have been in the system. They won't need to do it anymore as they have in the past. Um, it also, um, you know, as a result would cut down on what is a complex process. Uh, as many of you know, if you've served an election judge, election day registration is somewhat complicated in the polling place on election day. So this will, among other things, help election day run more smoothly. The second thing I want to comment in on the bill on, on Senate File 3 is restoration of the rights of people to vote who are no longer incarcerated. I don't want to belabor the point because it's up on the House floor today. I know it's been, uh, as a standalone bill heard before you, you heard a lot of testimony. Suffice it to say, I do think it's time more than 20 other states, including North Dakota, Iowa's on its way, Florida's on its way, have done the exact same thing. If someone has made a determination, a judge, a jury, someone else, so that a person is safe enough uh, and worthy enough to be among us, then surely they're worthy enough to have a say and a stake in what happens to them. And that's pro-social behavior that makes them far less likely to reoffend. The next item I just want to uh, highlight in this bill uh, is pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. Again, like automatic voter registration, it's somewhat of a misnomer. They're not actually registered, they're pre-registered. So a 16 or 17-year-old would be able to submit a voter registration application and that registration would be fully processed when they turn 18. And one critical benefit of pre-registration is that it allows young people to get involved even before they're eligible to cast a ballot. And we know that when young people think of themselves as voters before they actually are voters, they're far more likely to vote that first time they're eligible at 18, 19, 20, or whatever. And if they do that, we know that they're far more likely to make voting a lifelong habit. And I think that's a good thing. Critically, we do some version of this already. As many of you know, maybe from constituents, we already have a law on the books. This is the current law, that if you're 17 but will be 18 by the time of the next election, you can already do some form of this. So this is simply expanding it to age 16. It's something we already do without incident, and something red states do, blue states do, and it really has moved the needle. There have been studies. This isn't just happy talk. Um, there, there's evidence out there. There are studies that show that it really can move the needle in ter terms of youth engagement and participation. So I think the time has come for this as well. Um, uh, from the standpoint of election integrity, pre-registration really ensures that more voters, not fewer, have gone through the database checks prior to election day. That's really the bottom line. So it's really going to make our system even safer and our voter rolls, I would argue, even cleaner than they are right now. The next item I just want to touch on, members, is increased language access. Uh, that, I think, is a really great part of this bill. 
Our office has already chosen, state law doesn't mandate us to do so, but we have chosen to translate voter information into 11 different languages. Again, there's no law that says we have to do that. But ensuring that these materials are available in relevant polling places will ensure that voters have the information they need in the form they need to engage in the process confidently and without issue. It's worked really, really well across uh, Minnesota where it's been done, and this would just put those guardrails into state law. Again, in, in, on our office's end, we already do it um, uh, with 11 different languages. Uh, the next item that I just want to highlight is permanent absentee voting. Uh, this too is something that's uh, been adopted um, with great success and popularity around the country. Um, and it, Minnesota law already provides that a voter can opt into a permanent absentee voter list. The problem is what they get every cycle is just an application. They don't get the actual ballot. And we want to move in the direction of providing the actual ballot. Again, many other states have done this as well, and voters like it, and it's a secure process by which to ensure that more people can get involved. I want to emphasize there are other ports, parts in the bill, many other parts. I'm not going to speak to any other of them. You're going to hear from a lot of testifiers, but let me just say that all of the things that I've mentioned that I'm here to talk about in the bill are things that are nonpartisan in origin and nonpartisan in effect. You'll find that red states do them, blue states do them, they are among best practices that are shared among secretaries of state. I don't mean to suggest that they all agree with them. They don't. But um, these are things that um, have nationwide buy-in and, and success, I would say. So I, I just want to uh, uh, end where I started by thanking you, Mr. Chair, and I want to particularly thank Senator Bolden for her hard work on this very comprehensive bill. So thanks for your time and attention, and I hope this uh, bill makes it to its next stop. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Next person on the testifier list is uh, Minister Janae Bates. Hello, hello, thank you for having me, Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Minister Janae Bates. I am the Communications Director with Isaiah. I am also an Associate Minister at Camphor Memorial United Methodist Church in St. Paul. And I am also the Communications uh, Chair for the Restore the Vote Table, which is a coalition in the state of about 70 organizations that include legal and public safety, victims advocacy, faith, direct service, and civil rights groups. And I am here uh, in huge support of voter restoration rights and that part of this bill. Um, thank you so much uh, for including it. I think it's incredibly important to have it as part of this bill uh, because when we're talking about this notion of bringing multiracial democracy um, across the state, ensuring that every single Minnesotan has a voice, that also includes the 55,000 men and women, uncles, cousins, moms, dads, children who deserve to have their voting rights and their voice restored. And that group of folks, even though it is most certainly, uh, we, we in this state have um, disproportionately uh, uh, disenfranchised black and brown people, the Restore the Vote bill would actually benefit largely white folks. Um, and nearly 70% of that 55,000 folks live in rural and greater Minnesota. So beyond the fact of all of that and all of these really amazing, incredible, dynamic reasons to support such an important bill um, for the heart of Minnesota, I am also here on behalf of this man. Um, this man is named Dantes. He has been incarcerated for his entire adult life. Um, it will be nearly 18 years. And he is, he has spent that 18 years doing a remarkable amount of work, um, both for himself and personal development, educational and vocational development, but also extending that out. Uh, he's created a program in the prison where he is, where over 250 men have gone through it to learn how to 
to have healthy interpersonal relationships, how to create change in their own communities for the better, how to be great civic participants and engage in their community. And he is currently incarcerated in Ohio in a state that has a uh, Republican governor and Senate and, uh, and House of Representatives. And they have chosen that when he re is released from Ohio, that he would be able to vote there. And they do that not because they have a D or an R on their title, but it is because they recognize that he's a human being and his full humanity should be honored. And so uh, this man also happens to be my husband. And so he will be making his home right here in Minnesota. And so I ask that you all recognize his full humanity and allow him to have a voice here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bates. Uh, next testifier is uh, Mr. Jeff, Jeff Sigurdsson from the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. And, and I believe you have a, uh, a video to show or some uh, slides to show. Mr. Bates, or, sorry, Mr. Sigurdsson, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, board member, or committee members. My name is Jeff Sigurdsson. I'm the executive director of the Campaign Finance Board. Please same thing. Get... We'll and close right. to you. Thank you. And I'm going to need a sign on. Just one, one second here. Uh, Senator Bolden asked me to uh, comment on that portion of Senate File 3, which is similar to the legislative recommendations that the board has presented to the legislature. Um, the board, to, be, to clarify, the board doesn't have a position on Senate File 3 in its entirety, but does agree with the provision that you see in Article 3, Section 1, which is to move the state away from the expressly advocating standard only for independent expenditures and moving into the functional equivalent standard. Very quickly, um, just so we're all on the same page, the current standard of expressly advocating means that the expenditure has to clearly identify a candidate and then use what are usually referred to as the magic words, vote for, or against, elect, support, cast your vote for, defeat, stop, etc. There are roughly a dozen of those. And while most cases, um, Independent expenditures are identified by those, by those words. There are certainly a number of communications that pretty clearly are trying to influence voting in Minnesota that don't use those words. And the board is concerned that uh, there may be a growth in those expenditures, and I have a few examples to show you. The other chart, very quickly, I think you saw probably the Star Tribune story this morning, and you may have seen it, where the independent expenditures at the 2022 election, apparently it were about $63 million. And you can see on that chart how it moves up in 2022, the blue line, uh, the blue bar is the amount spent on independent expenditures by independent expenditure committees and funds. The yellow is political committees and the green is party units. And you can see the growth in independent expenditures from 1994 when it was less than a half a million dollars to now again, $65 million approximately. I want to clarify that there's nothing here that's going to limit independent expenditures. There's nothing that's certainly going to prohibit independent expenditures. But the board's concern is that as much as that number may be impressive, it's not inclusive. Uh, not all expenditures to influence elections are reported to the board. And we have, have had uh, complaints filed and investigations incurred where we see that that's the case. We also have looked at various FEC uh, applications where you can look at advertising to see if it was ever reported and examine those, uh, those advertisements and have learned that, in fact, many have never been reported to the board, which then raises the question of how a complete a question or a complete a picture the board is able to provide the public on what uh, on those entities that are trying to influence elections in Minnesota. I have a few examples, uh, bear with me, uh, because they are um, campaign commercials. They are going to be a little bit partisan, uh, but I have partisan on both sides. Um, this one is from 2014, 
the advertisement ran to 885 times in Minnesota at a cost of a million and sixty-three thousand dollars. None of that was reported to the board because it didn't meet the expressly advocating standard. Governor and the Democrats completely control our state government. And look at what they're doing. They're building a new luxury office building for themselves. A building that will cost taxpayers $77 million. And to pay for their new luxury office building, they passed a record-setting tax increase. And our property taxes went up. Instead of wasting our tax dollars on their new luxury office building, why are Governor Dayton and the Democrats fixing our roads and potholes? Minnesota, we deserve better. Again, the issue here isn't that they can't run the ad. The issue is that that ad was never, the committee that uh, ran that ad never registered with the board, never disclosed those, independent, those, those advertisements, which the board believes would be under the functional equivalent standard, but would clearly be independent expenditures. And so we have no knowledge about the, the source of funding. I don't think that helps the public's understanding of the influences on elections, and, and again, could even go down to the level of saying the public doesn't trust what it's seeing because there's no information on those types of advertisements. Here's another one from 19, uh, excuse me, from 2014. The advertisement ran uh, in 2014 and cost $1,395,000. farms and in factories, in classrooms, and construction sites, Minnesota is working. Four years ago, Minnesota faced a $5 billion deficit. But Governor Mark Dayton showed strong leadership. He raised taxes on the wealthiest 2% so we could invest in our schools and reduce middle class taxes. Now Minnesota has over 150,000 new jobs and a budget surplus. Governor Mark Dayton is working for us. Now the question I have there is, did you identify the express advocacy? And the answer is there wasn't any. Now I want to emphasize this was reported to the board as an independent expenditure, but it didn't need to be. We're concerned, the board's concerned, that at some point entities, associations may decide that, well, look, they're doing this advertisement and they don't have to disclose anything uh, to the board. Why are we going through all the work of registering a committee and reporting all this information to the board if we just avoid using certain words? And by the way, it's easy to avoid using those certain words. Even if you report it as an independent expenditure, in many cases they don't use words of express advocacy. Which again, I, the board is just concerned that this may in the end uh, lead entities to decide it's, it's simply easier to avoid 12 words and, and go from there. Other examples I'll just quickly go through. It also occurs at primary elections. This was at the uh, Republican primary for uh, then State Representative Jennifer Loon. Um, the board did an investigation because a complaint was filed but found that because the magic words were not used, that organization did not need to register with the board or report the cost of, those, of the mailings. Another one more recently, uh, again, because there's no use of the words vote for or vote against, um, there was no requirement for this association to register with the board and provide information on the cost of, the, of, the, uh, of this mailing. In some cases, it's hard to even track. This is one that, again, the board did investigate because it was brought forward as a complaint. This is actually a web banner. Um, uh, and so it's, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to be able to track what's going on in the internet. But again, uh, the board looked at it. They didn't uh, specifically, or, or excuse me, expressly advocate for an election or defeat of a candidate. So that organization didn't need to register or report the cost of those advertisements. This one's a little bit more confusing. There's actually no words here at all except the name of the, of the, uh, of the candidate and the office. But the board determined that if you're going to do a, uh, basically a 30 by 40 foot billboard, that that was in fact uh, for the purpose of influencing the election. This is a little bit of a strange one. I'll take a 30 seconds to explain. This was from 2010. This was prior to the, uh, the standard that we now have, have expressly advocating. Prior to that, it was actually just said for the purpose of influencing elections would be an independent expenditure. And under that standard, the board found that this was an independent expenditure and we did need to have disclosure. Under the current standard of express advocacy, this would not have to be disclosed to the board. It often happens in mailers. Here's some more. Uh, this was sent out, uh, I believe, seven times uh, during the district. None of them was reported to the board. And it also leads to an inconsistent standard, which 
I actually think can be confusing to those associations which are, are making independent uh, expenditures. The federal standard uh, is already functional equivalent, and it has been for going on almost 20 years. And so, for example, this particular one, which is basically comparing the candidates, who's for, who's against these, these issues, under the federal standard, this is an independent expenditure, and this did have to be reported to the FEC. This is the state, I think, equivalent, and because they didn't use any words of express advocacy, this didn't have to be reported to the state, to the board. So we have an inconsistent standard in terms of federal elections and state elections. We have examples of uh, expenditures being made that are not reported to the board and associations that are not registering with the board. And then we do see, and this is more hypothetical, the, the potential of those entities who are currently registered and reporting to the board deciding that, why are we doing this? Uh, we might as well opt out and simply avoid using words of express advocacy. So for those various reasons, the board is advocating moving uh, for the legislature to move uh, a provision very similar to this. I will say that the board's wording is a little different, but it's similar. Uh, that would move us to a functional equivalent standard and that would allow us uh, at that point then for um, all those communications to be viewed as independent expenditures that do need to be reported. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson. Thank you for the, uh, uh, the seminar on express advocacy. That is an extremely important issue for us here. Um, we are going to continue with testifiers, but I'm going to... I'm going to provide a, uh, uh, a little bit of a, of a jump here to uh, Mr. Kaldar Mohammed because he has to leave. So uh, we'll hear his testimony next, and then we'll continue back with the, uh, the list as we have it. Please be sure to sign in. and. Uh, Identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. And we will go back to the three minute timing. Can you guys hear me clear? Good. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kadar Mohammed, and I am a leader of the Muslim Coalition of Isaiah. I live in South Minneapolis and I am a senior at Oxford University where I look forward to graduating in May. I've been involved in uh, democracy and, and fighting for my community since 2020. Since then, it's been an amazing experience being politically active and being aware of the issues that I partake within my community, city, and state. In this last election, I was devastated to hear uh, eligible Somali elders in my community whose first language is not English struggle to register and vote because they didn't understand the language. Some of them were told they couldn't get help even though they have the right uh, to interpretation support at the polls. After uh, knocking thousands of doors uh, with Muslim coalition and encouraging and educating hundreds of elders uh, of the importance of voting, uh, it's discouraging for them, to, uh, for them to not get the assistance they need when they're voting or registering. Uh, it is uh, very unfortunate uh, that they're dealt with poorly at the polls but they're citizens. They care about our democracy and want to participate. They deserve to have a voice too, even if it isn't in English. By increasing materials printed in languages other than English and more uh, multi-bilingual uh, multi election judges, it will eliminate confusion so we can ensure these voters can be supported each year when they show up to vote in a welcoming environment. The, the reality is that we have been providing this option since voting started in our state. But at the time, it was for languages like French, Swedish, and Norwegian. The languages have changed, but our commitment to supporting voters has not. Nevertheless, when it comes to welcoming and safe voting environment for everyone, we also need to ensure people's physical safety is protected at the polls. We have seen an increase in political violence a lot in which have been targeted at Muslims and immigrant, immigrant communities, largely due to disinformation campaign about who is or isn't voting with. With this increase in the threat of violence and intimidation, it is important we strengthen protection for voters at the polls. 
No one deserves to have their safety put in jeopardy while uh, being engaged in such an important part of our democracy. To protect our democracy and people, we must seek to strengthen and expand it. This bill, Senate File 3, would do that by bringing more people into process who have been too reluctant, scared, or intimidated to vote for so long. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, next testifier is Mary Hartnett. Ms. Hartnett, please identify yourself for the record and who you're with and proceed with your testimony. Well, I'm, I'm Mary Hartnett and I'm the Executive Director of Clean Elections Minnesota. I will be very brief. Um, I um, uh, th First, I want to uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today uh, in support of, uh, of Senate File 3. And we thank Senator Bolden uh, for introducing this important legislation that will protect and expand democracy. I'm here to support Article 3, the campaign finance and disclosure provisions in the bill. Big money has too much influence in Minnesota's elections and diminishes the influence of small donors and everyday people who are most impacted by policies passed by the state legislature. We've already testified um, before you. Um, one of my board members, Ken Peterson, was here uh, to talk about um, banning the uh, banning foreign corporations from contributing to campaigns. And I'm not going to go through those points again. We've already stated our position. And uh, Mr. Sigerson just eloquently <laughs> described the problems that we have uh, with uh, express advocacy and uh, in uh, independent expenditures. And we support both of those provisions of the bill, believe that they would make a big difference uh, in our elections, letting uh, voters know uh, who is paying for what, uh, when the uh, independent expenditures are, um, are made in campaigns and will help to restore, res, res, uh, will help to restore more faith in our elections and that's good for, de for democracy. Urge your support for Senate File 3. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hartnett. Next testifier is Mr. Eric Wong from People United for Privacy. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Wang. I'm a political law attorney based in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I represent and advise clients on campaign finance laws at the federal level uh, and in all 50 states. Uh, I'm appearing today on behalf of People United for Privacy, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works to ensure that all Americans have the right to uh, support the causes that they believe in uh, without fear of harassment or intimidation. Uh, I'd like to address the provision that Mr. Sigurdsson was um, addressing before and also the you know, previous speaker. Um, with respect to Mr. Sigurdsson, I don't think he presents the full, um, the full picture on this provision because he only talks about reporting of the spending on independent expenditures. What he doesn't mention is that in Minnesota, when you make independent expenditures, the organization has to register a report as a political fund. And that means the organization also has to report generally all of its donors. And Mr. Sigurdsson also compared the, the provision to federal law. And again, unlike federal law, where uh, independent expenditure reports are only required to report certain donors who give for political purposes to the organization, again, in Minnesota, the consequences are the organization would have to broadly report its donors. And so basically, in short, what this provision would do is that it would expand the scope of regulated speech in Minnesota that triggers public reporting of an organization's donors. And we've heard a lot of talk today already about protecting people from uh, harassment and intimidation and making sure every uh, voice is heard. And this provision is antithetical to those values, quite frankly. So the popular narrative is that this is all about transparency, which is supposed to be a good thing, and that this is supposed to be cracking down on so-called dark money organizations, as the bill sponsor said before. Uh, but to invoke two popular narratives, um, where you stand on this issue depends on where you sit. Stated alternatively, it all depends on whose ox is being gored. So for liberals, the dark money organizations are the ones on the right, like Donors Trust. 
For conservatives, the dark money organizations are ones on the left, like the 1630 Fund. Uh, but dark money organizations are never the groups that support you or that you support. The, the truth is, dark money organizations include well-known organizations taking both sides of important policy issues, uh, from pro-life to pro-choice groups, uh, to, to, uh, from pro-life pro to pro-choice groups, uh, from gun control to gun rights groups, from LGBT rights to family values groups, uh, from groups that are looking to restrict uh, public school curricula to groups that are looking to expand the viewpoints that school children are exposed to. All of these are hot button issues that have to be hashed out in the public arena because public uh, participation and public debate are fundamental to the democratic process. At the same time, there has to be an element of privacy to these activities. Organizations that represent different viewpoints on these issues and their donors are entitled to protect to, the, uh, to protect the privacy of those donors. And SF3 would deter all of these organizations from advocating for their positions because these organizations often have to address elected officials like you all, because in a democracy, you all are the ones who enact the policy changes. And Mr. these Wayne, organizations please, please speech, finish your uh, when they're directed at elected officials are deemed to be express advocacy for or against elected officials, then under the broader express advocacy standard that SF3 would enact, uh, their donors would have to be publicly outed and named, shamed, fired from their jobs, and perhaps even fired upon. Thank you, it's thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wang. We, we, need, to, we need to button thank up you. here. Uh, I think you're at, a, at a, a point where you can end, right? Uh, yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next testifier is uh, Mr. Ron Fine. Thank you. I'm Ron Fine. I'm the legal director of Free Speech for People, a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization that works on campaign finance reform. And I would like to talk specifically about the provisions of the bill that uh, prohibits corporate political spending by foreign influenced corporations. And just for some context, um, this is not something unique to Minnesota. This is part of a model legislative wave that's been moving around the country. Uh, legislation like this has been in effect in the city of Seattle since January 2020, including through a major election cycle. It was just passed through one house of the New York State Legislature and is expected to pass later this session and is pending in several other states. Uh, this legislation, this provision, is not about xenophobia. It's not about opposition to immigrants or foreign investment in U.S. corporations, but rather it's about democratic self-government. And the basic idea is that if a, a foreign wealthy entity, like I'll just give one example, the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, which is its oil wealth fund, is already prohibited from directly spending money in Minnesota elections or, or federal elections or anywhere else, but it owns several percentages of major US corporations and can then be tremendously influential in their corporate governance uh, when they are spending money in elections. So this bill would ban those foreign influenced corporations from spending money in Minnesota elections. Uh, it is constitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Blumen versus Federal Election Commission upheld uh, a ban on, again, foreign entities direct directly spending their own money in elections. And if they can't spend their own money directly, then they shouldn't be able to acquire a stake in a US corporation and then leverage that stake uh, to influence its corporate governance and spend money in Minnesota elections. Uh, the last point I wanna make, uh, some people uh, look at that 1% threshold and they think, boy, that, that seems small. You know, in a legislature or a committee, you might need 50% plus one to do anything. What is 1%? 1% of a major corporation, you're talking $50 million, maybe hundreds of million dollars. It's tremendously influential. If you own 1% of an S&P 500 corporation, you can get the CEO on the phone uh, within 24 hours. Because corporate governance is, is quite different from uh, uh, legislative processes in some ways like that. Uh, we've submitted a testimony on the House side in detail in writing that uh, goes into all of these issues in tremendously uh, tremendous detail, including supportive letters from outside experts, uh, law professors, a federal election commissioner, and would be happy upon request to provide that here as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fine. 
Our next speaker is uh, Arlene Datu, and that's also via Zoom. Yes. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Arlene Datu. I spent most of my professional life working at a number of major corporations in Minnesota and Chicago. I left the corporate world in 2007, but I had long ago realized the truth about corporations, and that is they only look out for themselves. As a corporate employee, I was told time and again that we were the most important resource. They told us we're a team and we're in this together, when in reality, we were the first to lose our jobs when profits took a hit. Corporations prioritize their shareholders, who are often the executives and CEOs themselves, and they only look out for their own investments. It's very clear to me corporate interests are very different from the employees and the community's interests. Yet corporations and other special interests have massive influence on who runs for office and what issues they decide to talk about. I often felt pressure to give to our company's corporate PAC. Oftentimes, I wasn't told where my money would go or what it would end up supporting. So it is absolutely essential that we change our current system to limit the influence of these corporate actors. In this last biennial election, we saw an influx of grassroots donors who felt empowered to elect leaders who represented them and their communities. But corporations funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars through many different and often dark channels. In order to create a system that works for all of us, we need to expand access to voting and make it possible for people's voices to count through both their vote and financial means. Right now, we are currently at a disadvantage against corporations. We have to close the loopholes in our campaign finance system and restore power to Minnesotans. We need to prohibit foreign-influenced corporations from spending in our elections. And we need to adopt the federal standards for express advocacy so we can start updating outdated transparency and disclosure laws in our state so that people actually see who is spending in our elections and how much they are spending. I think the Democracy for the People Act is a necessary step in the right direction to do all of this. And I want to thank you all for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Datu. I appreciate your perspective. Uh, next, we have uh, Sarah Gonski, uh, and also by, via Zoom. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Gonski, and I'm a senior policy advisor at the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. We're a nonpartisan organization that advocates for an election process that's more efficient, accurate, and secure. We strongly support Senate File 3, which would bring secure automatic voter registration to Minnesota. Secure ABR will increase access for eligible citizens, create administrative efficiencies, and help ensure the integrity and the accuracy of our voter registration rolls. Secure ABR streamlines the voter registration process for a specific group of Minnesotans, people who present a document during agency transactions that demonstrate their United States citizenship. Those applicants with confirmed eligibility are mailed a notice providing an opportunity to decline voter registration if they wish to opt out. When Colorado implemented a similar upgrade a few years ago, it almost doubled the registration rate of unregistered licensing customers, and it led to significant administrative efficiencies. The bottom line is that secure ABR is good government. Americans spend 11 billion hours a year filling out government forms. This system removes a bureaucratic task from both voters and election officials alike. When Minnesotans are already conducting a transaction with a state agency and they're already providing all of the required information to verify that they are eligible voters, let's increase efficiency and access by eliminating labor-intensive additional data processing. 
at the end of the day, secure ABR is a nonpartisan, common sense, good government upgrade. We support making it available in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and thank you to Senator Bolden for her sponsorship. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Gonski. Our next testifier is Mr. Paul Hoffman. Huffman, Paul Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson and committee members for this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I'm Paul Huffman. I'm testifying today based on my experience as a head election judge over the last three years in four different precincts in Washington County. I am also a member of the Board of Directors and am the Voter Service Chair for the League of Voters of Minnesota, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that serves voters. I also am a graduate of the University of Minnesota Humphrey School Election Administration Program and also am retired from the United States Navy. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to speak in favor of three aspects of uh, how Senate File 3. Uh, first, uh, in the precincts I've served in as a head election judge, they've covered a wide range of communities and provide a valuable perspective on how we can help voters and election workers uh, in our elections. This is especially applicable to reducing a number of election day registrations, which in my experience range from anywhere from 3% to 10% of election day voters. Automatic voter registration, as we've heard, allows voters to register to vote when they update information with the state, um, such as when moving or undergoing some other life change. This reduces the potential for administrative errors, which is the most likely uh, reason people might have an issue with voting and their registration, and it reduces the workload required for county election offices to enter paper registration forms in the state registration system. Uh, this benefits election judges by reducing the number of administrative errors that might be identified on election day. It reduces the number of voters using election day registration and the workload that comes with that. And it increases the confidence and integrity of our voter rolls. Uh, Pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, as we've heard, enables young people to be entered into the system earlier um, in order to engage them and educate them in their rights and responsibilities as they prepare to become voters. Um, for many young people, the first election when they're eligible to vote occurs when they're away from home, either for college or military service. Uh, this makes it much more difficult for them to register and vote as they're not already registered. Many election day registrations that we election judges do are for new voters, and we enjoy doing that. Uh, however, every new election day registration we do is a significant amount of work and uh, provides opportunity for error. Finally, I want to uh, speak in favor of permanent absentee ballot status. This is a valuable service for those voters who, due to a variety of personal circumstances, choose to or need to vote by absentee ballot each election. Uh, our experience in voter service is that there are many voters whose situation warrants voting absentee for the foreseeable future. This can include long-term military service, such as I experienced, residents with disabilities impacting the ability to go to the polls, and those who are unable or reluctant to vote in person at the polling place. In my experience, many of these individuals are lifelong voters, but must apply for absentee ballots each year in order to vote. Uh, this can be a challenge for those individuals as they may require assistance in that. So I want to thank you again for your, this opportunity and uh, uh, ask your support in Senate File 3. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Our next testifier is uh, Lupi Tejada Diaz. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is this fine? Wonderful. Uh, my name is Lupe de Jala Diaz. Thank you. Um, and I am a resident of the Ninth Ward in South Minneapolis and a, need a leader with Unidos MN. Um, as an indigenous person, immigrant, and active member of my community, I can attest to the importance of seeing my lived experience recognized and represented within the political structures of Minnesota and the United States as a whole. My story is not unique. It is one that I have seen replayed time and time again across the nation. My mother wanted something more for me and my sister, a life free from political and socioeconomic distress that we were experiencing in our home country. It is only now that we have a name for what we were, political and environmental refugees. Migration has been a part of the tribal history of my people for time immemorial, and indigenous people have a deep connection and love for the land. 
Although the structures and systems have changed over time, the goal remains the same, a better life. It was through community care and the sacrifices of my elders that I was able to find my voice and find a way to advocate for my people. I was lucky enough to have had access to education and political literacy, and through access to this knowledge, I was able to align myself with systems that work to improve the lives of the people who I love so much. I firmly believe that our future voters, our youth, deserve access to these same resources. Ultimately, they are the ones who are going to be our greatest hope for the future, not corporations. Our people have hopes and dreams, and they stand with us, and they hold us in our grief and our joy, and they are the key to not only protecting our democracy, but expanding it. Our constituents are eager to have a say in the decisions that will impact their lives, and the only way to make sure that happens is through education and initiatives um, that put people first. Automatic voter registration and the Democracy for the People Act opens doors that many of our eligible voting community members didn't even know existed. What we need is a democracy that works for everyone, no exceptions, and I believe that these initiatives help create the conditions needed for people in my community, particularly our eligible youth, to intentionally take the responsibility we hold within democracy. A multicultural, multiracial, multigenerational democracy doesn't have to remain a dream. We have the power to make it a reality here and now. Uh, thank you so much to Mr. Chair and the members of the committee. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Next testifier is uh, Sean Lim. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Lim. Thank you, Chair Carlson, Senator Bolden, and committee members for having me. Um, again, my name is Sean Lim, I use he, him pronouns, and I am a community organizer. At 23 years old, I am also the program director at the Minnesota Youth Collective. MNYC is an organization which seeks to build the political power of young people here in Minnesota through civic engagement, issue advocacy, leadership development, and more. I'm here today uh, testifying in favor of SF3, the Democracy for the People Act. Throughout my life, I have walked thousands of fellow Minnesotans through the voter registration process myself since uh, I was 15 years old, years before I could even vote. I fundamentally believe in the power of young people. We are quite literally the future of this state. And Minnesotans 18 to 36 are also the fastest growing voter bloc, soon to be the most influential. Implementing automatic voter registration and pre-registration would set the foundational groundwork for a more representative democracy, dismantling existing roadblocks for democratic participation for young people across the state, urban and rural. I am a strong proponent of the pre-registration aspect of this uh, omnibus because it would allow for 16 and 17 year olds to be able to apply to vote and be ready to cast their ballot the moment they turn 18. I'm especially excited about what this means for all of our high schoolers across the state and their civic engagement. As we know, research has proven time and time again that folks who participate in the first election they're eligible to vote in are more likely and more uh, capable to consistently vote in every single other election for the rest of their lives. As Secretary Simon uh, stated, this makes voting a lifelong habit for all of us. Pre-registration saves the state of Minnesota time, money, and invaluable resources while also greatly investing in uh, increasing voter turnout. Young people, students, renters, we are all busy and highly mobile. We move between dorms, apartments, homes every single year. Every time we do, we need to re-register and update our addresses. That costs the state another additional paper form. Back-end AVR is proven through uh, programs that have been implemented in other states to be the most effective policy to add eligible voters to the rolls. It does away with our arduous data entry that staff have to implement. It eliminates duplicates and updates voter lists with accurate address information every time someone moves. No additional action is needed on behalf of voters. That makes this system safe, efficient, secure, and seamless. Critical updates can also be made easily to prevent potential tampering. 
Overall, our current paper systems are antiquated and outdated, and replacing them with an automatic one would save millions in taxpayer dollars, save time for staff, and reinforce election security. It costs an average of $3.64 to process each paper form that comes into the Secretary of State's office, compared to just three cents over AVR. For all of those reason, reasons that I just listed, I urge your support for SF3 in this session to protect our democracy and uh, do so by expanding it, paving the way for a more representative electorate overall. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Dilliam. Uh, in next testimony, testifier is uh, Mr. John Runnington. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson, Vice Chair Westland, and Ranking Minority Member Corrin, and members of the committee. Uh, I would first like to say thank you, Senator Bolden, for bringing up this bill. Uh, hello, my name is John Runnigan. I am the president of Lita Men. It's a nonprofit organization that represents 100,000 community and technical college students across Minnesota. Um, Lita Men represent, uh, I am here to speak in favor of Senate File 3 because it will help young people register to vote. Over the last several years, Lita Men has registered over 10,000 students to vote as part of our program to grow voters in Minnesota. Lita Men seeks to make voting a habit in young people through a long term approach of providing civic education, creating civic agency, and tearing down institutional barriers that prevent students from voting. This legislation will tear down one of those barriers that we see in the voter registration process for first time voters. Former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, knowledge about the ideas embodied in the Constitution and the ways in which it shapes our lives is not passed down from generation to generation through the gene pool. It must be learned anew by each generation. Allowing for pre-registration creates an opportunity for high schools to teach students to be engaged citizens. For example, as a student at Kennedy Secondary School in Fergus Falls, I learned the ABCs of democracy. But like many of my classmates, I checked out sometimes because this content did not feel relevant to me. It didn't I didn't really care about who was running and what major topics were being voted on because I had to wait until I was 18 to register and feel like my opinion truly mattered. Allowing young people to register early sends a message that their voices and opinions are valued and helps build a foundation for civic engagement. It wasn't until I turned 18 that I realized how far behind I was in the understanding of how our system works and just how important all of our involvement was. At that point in my life, I didn't have teachers there to help me out and I, like many others, had to learn to do this on my own. Allowing 16 and 17 year olds the opportunity to register to vote helps by providing an on-ramp for students to become engaged citizens. They will also have the opportunity to have the support of their teachers to help them understand what it means to be civically engaged. By having the support, we are helping equip a larger portion of the population to participate in the political process. This would help ensure that the government better represents the diverse views and perspectives of its citizens. Finally, this will give the students a chance to experience what they are learning in the classroom instead of waiting for the opportunity to apply what they have learned. We all know that democracy is not a spectator sport and this legislation will help actively engage more young people in our democracy and that is something that we can all get behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rennington. Next testifier is Matt Kinney. Please state your name for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Committee Chair Carlson and members of the Elections Committee. My name is Matt Kinney. I live in St. Louis Park, and I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 3. Our country was founded on the fundamental idea that the government is in place to serve all of us fairly. For me and other white males, that promise has largely been kept. That promise, however, has historically been undermined for large parts of our population, undermined by those with power and money trying to preserve their advantages. That's simply unfair and counter to our founding principles. Our democracy gets stronger every time we expand the vote and make it easier for voters to exercise their rights. We have made some progress. At first, only white male property owners were allowed to vote. But over time, and with much struggle, the vote was expanded by the 15th Amendment ending racial restrictions, the 19th Amendment ending gender restrictions, and the 26th Amendment lowering the voting age to 18. 
But money and power don't go down without a fight. Our history is full of strategies used by those in power to limit voting. In the past, things like poll taxes and literacy tests were used. More recently, restrictions on voting hours, polling places, early voting, and voting by mail have been proposed. This bill represents the next necessary step towards living up to our nation's promise. Highlights for me are expanding the vote by eliminating restrictions on voting for over 50,000 formerly incarcerated Minnesotans, pre-registering 16 and 17 year olds to make it more likely they will become lifelong voters, and uh, making it easier to register and keep registrations up to date through automatic voter registration. And last but not least, efforts to reduce the impact of money on our elections. I'm asking you, legislators of both parties, to support this bill so that we can take the next steps towards a truly inclusive democracy in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinney. That covers all of the testifier, testifiers who have previously signed up. And now we'll go to questions from members. And we can direct those to uh, Senator Bolton through the chair. And I'll first call on Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Please use your question. Yeah, I, I did send a, um, actually a, a list of questions in an email. Um, that I had um, previously reviewed with um, Senator Bolden and I also copied um, uh, Ms. Stangle. And um, I can go back over them again. I have um, most of them since the um, uh, democracy uh, dollars coupons have been removed from, from the bill. I, I am much more encouraged <laughs> About um, about the bill, but I and now I'm not I'm now I'm going to lose my email here, but um, uh, Senator Bolden, I wonder if you if you do you have your um, phone or anything with you that you could look at the email? We could review them together. Um, Ms. Stangle, I wonder if I could ask you to do it. I'm trying to find them here now. Yes, Senator. Oh, you we, can ask. You can call on someone else while I locate it. Okay, Senator. We Thompson. do want to get the questions into the record. Sure. So, if, yes, if uh, somebody does find them, um, other other members. Senator Glimmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. What do you expect for ninety million dollars spent on this building? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, oh, I'm so out of line. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to follow up on Senator Rest's question or comment about the democracy dollar portion. Has that been deleted from the bill? Senator Bolton. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, yes, that portion uh, is no longer in the bill with my uh, delete all amendments that we adopted. That's and correct. Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Limmer. Is it going to be traveling in another piece of legislation, or is it something that you as chief author do not want to advance at all? Senator Bolton. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, um, it will, it or something similar to it will be traveling in a, in a separate bill. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair. Senator Cran. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Bolton, on the, uh, on the translator portion of the bill, what what are the financial considerations and what funding will be made, made available to the counties, cities, and the municipalities that are managing elections? Senator Bolton. Mr. Chair and Senator, um, so we have requested a fiscal note for this bill and have not yet received one. Um, so I don't have uh, specific numbers to share with you, but we'll say that it is um, the intention. I think it's important to be sure that uh, counties have the resources they need to be able to carry out the work that they need to do. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, Senator Chair we, we've had the conversation, or maybe we have a, a false sense of uh, understanding how the process is going to work. Are, is it your intention to move bills that have a fiscal impact out of a committee like ours um, prior to having a fiscal note so we can understand the impact on the state of Minnesota taxpayers? Well, Senator Cran, um, what you may remember from past experience in the elections committee is that 
uh, running the elections and the costs of doing so are covered by the county. Now, we can certainly, uh, if we need to, put some money into more program aid, but that is a responsibility of the county to uh, run the elections. Yep, Mr. Chair, and Mr. With, that, with that, the, uh, and this particular component, um, yes, it is a cost that would be placed upon those counties, but there are many aspects of this which will have a fiscal component, campaign finance and, and a variety of changes that will impact state resources, including the Secretary of State, programmatic changes, and so there's a significant financial impact outside of this particular, um, my, my previous question. So will we move bills out of this committee that have financial impact on state agencies um, without a fiscal note? I think that's, that is uh, probable. You know, we're going to keep finances separate from policy, so we will have uh, the financial uh, coverage of this in our, uh, our committee financial, uh, financial bill. So, Mr. Chair, that all financial, uh, or financial impacts for any bill coming through this body or any committee, it appears, will only land or be discussed in the Finance Committee? Is that what you're saying? I, I wouldn't say that they'll only be, if they're very clearly separate and, uh, and uh, uh, accountable, we'll, we'll discuss them here also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Rest. Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to that, I think I was just trying to find now um, the non-codified section of the bill, which I do think referenced, um, I think, uh, Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Bolden, the uh, impact on the Secretary of State's office. Do you recall where that is in your in your delete all amendment or Ms. Stangle? Where that is? Senate Council uh, will give us a little bit of, of uh, advice on that. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rest, are you looking for the appropriation to the Secretary of State? And if so, that's on page 19. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, um, Senator Rest. and Senator um, Coran, there, there is then one section that it does have an appropriation of uh, $14,000 on page um, uh, page 19, um, uh, section 21, 14,000, um, appropriated from the general fund to the Secretary of State to implement, these are not the voting ones, but to implement the um, uh, sections relating to restoring the civil right to vote. So there is, there is some money in here, but it's not about the um, elections themselves. Uh, then, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rest. Um, as I s indicated, um, had the opportunity to uh, review the A32 earlier today with um, with um, Senator Bolden, and and some of the things that we're going to bring up, I'm sure some people will think are really nitpicky, but um, we. Um, we often get tripped up when our language is not precise. On, line, on page 5, line 31, uh, there is the phrase um, a, about a report being um, uh, required at least monthly uh, without defining what at least monthly means, whether it's a calendar month or every four weeks or whatever that could... And my question um, is if um, at least monthly could mean March 31st, and then again yeah. April 1st, and the um, requirement uh, would be satisfied. Um, I was looking for the second instance of the phrase at least monthly, and I couldn't find it here, but I know it's used twice, and I'm, I'm uh, concerned that it does not have the precision that it should. Um, on page 7, line 12, uh, in the original bill, um, the, um, the phrase, or at least the concept, of the department systems being tested and um, accurately provide the necessary data, uh, the original date was December 1st, 2023. 
And I'm curious about why um, the department, the agency, needs another two years in order to provide those, um, uh, those assurances. Um, on page 9, line 16, there is the phrase complete information, and it is not uh, defined, and it is part of the duties of the Secretary of State, and it has read, the Secretary of State shall, dev shall develop accurate and complete information in a single publication, but it has no indication about what's included by the phrase um, complete information. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm curious about that and if it is improved by adding things like such as or um, including but not, but not, uh, not exclusive to um, uh, information so that the Secretary of State can have um, better direction from this, uh, this, uh, this bill. Senator Rusk, your, your list is getting quite long. What I'd like to do is I'd like to bring up Ms. Strother from the Secretary of State's office so that we can get some of these questions answered as you ask them, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. If she, if she wrote the language, I'd be very interested in hearing her, <laughs> her explanation. Yes, this, a lot of this was developed with the Secretary of State. I'm just trying to get through all of them, and then I'll be done, okay? <laughs> but... We might forget some of the early ones by the time you get through, depending on your list. <laughs> but um, Ms. Strother was working with uh, Senator Bolden on getting the uh, language on this put together. So uh, perhaps what we can do is get some of the answers as we go here. Um, Ms. Strother, please Julie, identify yourself for the record and continue. Julie Strother with the Office of the Secretary of State. On the um, first, which I recall to be at least monthly, that is something that we have in other places of state law regarding the data we get from driver and vehicle services already. So I, I understand it could be tightened up, but it is already repeated um, in other places in state law where there's an obligation to provide us data monthly. In practice, that ends up being a report that's usually run like the first Tuesday of the month, depending. Um, but uh, it's a phrase that appears in other places in state law. To the question about December 1st, 2025, that deals specifically with the data we get from um, uh, DHS. My understanding is that there's some compliance issues um, with DHS, and candidly, from our office's perspective, we already get data from driver and vehicle services daily already, and so we would prefer that for automatic voter registration, we start with driver and vehicle services data um, because we have those data channels already um, talking to each other and then make sure that um, that system is tight and then bring in the DHS data. But DHS can talk more to their timelines. And then on the last question that I heard, and I apologize if I missed one, um, the sentence about complete information, that is in Senator Champion's bill. So it's the um, restore the vote language that's moved in a few different places. Um, the way our office reads it um, is that we need to provide complete information about voting rights of the people who have been charged uh, with or convicted of a crime. We do provide a document about that already. It's a, um, I brought a copy of it. It's like a little fact sheet about um, what the impact of being charged with a crime is, what the impact of being convicted of a crime is, whether it's a felony or not, the different type of, of sentences. So. Um, I think we, if you wanted to provide, including but not limited to, we could add some of those examples um, that we've sort of made an assumption about in the document we provide already. And I think I covered um, three. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate um, Struthers' uh, responses, but uh, they really don't speak to the questions in my, in my mind. Uh, uh, just because a, a phrase, complete information, is in 10 other bills doesn't mean it's defined particularly well. And... Um, I, I think that we can be better than that. Uh, and maybe um, in the other bills, they would, they would take suggestions about what complete information actually um, meant or means. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I go on? I have Senator just four other things. Mm -hmm. um, on page 15, line 15, there is the phrase um, uh, telephone, or email as a way of um, uh, contacting the voters. And um, I'm suggesting that that phrase is going to quickly become obsolete. 
um, we may not have. If, if this bill is going to govern us for, um, you know, 20 years, let's say, um, we want uh, uh, not exactly inclusive, but flexible language to, to um, re reflect what may be possible. And um, so telephone or, or email is, to me, is not a phrase that, that is uh, uh, forward-looking with regard to technology. And um, I would suggest something like um, communication or elections technology, and then it can be anything, and, and not, um, not just uh, telephone, because it seems to me, too, even with the word telephone, we should, we should insert or text message. And um, five years from now, we might not be using text messaging. So I, I don't want to put something in the statute that within a very short period of time would be um, obsolete. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on page 19, Senator line 22, um, I, um, I have some difficulty with just listing the three most used languages for this very same reason. Um, ten years from now, those three languages might not be the three most used languages, and instead of adding to the language uh, a list of languages, or deleting some and putting others in, it seems to me even there, the formula that is developed for adding um, those services for other languages could, defined, could be defined there as well, and we don't need to, um, we don't need to, um, uh, we don't need to um, uh, uh, reference the, the, um, the three, um, the three languages, and um, when I tapped my iPad, I lost the email. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Stangle, I wonder the last two uh, points. Would you read them, please? I'm gonna try and find it again. Oh, I know what one of them is. Um, on, it's the page where um, there are three small sections. Um, the first time uh, the word um, individual is used, or vice versa, and the second time the word person is used. And it seems to me that we should be consistent, um, and we either use person or individual, and when I asked, um, uh, when I asked, um, actually the Secretary of State about that, uh, he said it could be something that would be um, challenged if an attorney came in and said, for example, in some sort of litigation, well, if you used person three times and individual one time, you must have meant something different because they were right next to one another and you didn't. And you didn't, um, uh, and you didn't distinguish between them. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, with regard to that one, I will have an amendment. I do have an amendment, and I see Senator Bolden uh, nodding. Um, if uh, Ms. Stangle has identified that part in the bill, I would uh, mean I would move to strike. Um, I think it's going to be strike individual and insert person. Do you have that? Senator Rest is offering an oral amendment. Yep. And council is looking for the place where you're talking about. So it must be uh, uh, line, or page 20, line 28. Is that correct, Senator Rest? Let's find it. Yes. Um, on page 20, and this is talking about interference and intimidation, with the voting process and penalties, uh, in 2025, the, the sentence starts out in terms of uh, what intimidation is. Um, uh, it says a person, and then if you go to um, sub one under there, it start it uses the word individual, and then in sub two it goes back to using the word person. 
So I would move to on line 2028, uh, delete, excuse me, delete individual and insert person. Okay, uh, I'll have uh, Senate Council repeat the uh, amendment where it's located and what it is. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. On the A32 amendment, page 20, line 28, the amendment is to delete individual and insert person. Senator Rest, that's your amendment? It certainly is. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Senator Anderson. Uh, on that same line, there's another individual on there. Yes. Should that be? Good. Yeah. So there should be two corrections, I would think, Senator Rest. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Anderson. Senator Rest. Um, uh, I believe that that, um, that that would be appropriate. Um, an individual with the intent to com compel another individual, perhaps. Uh, I don't know whether an individual works with the second individual or whether it should be another individual. But thank you, Senator Anderson. Ms. Stangle? Okay. Ms. Stangle will restate the uh, amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and a correction from the one before. So on the 832 amendment, page 20, line 28, in both instances, delete the phrase an individual and insert a person. Okay, thank you. That would be then. Um, thank you, Senator uh, Anderson. Yeah, thank you. Good, good spot. Uh, all in favor of that oral amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. And the oral my, amendment is adopted. And then, Mr. Chair, my, my last one is not, I don't know that it's fixed necessarily with um, <clears throat> with an amendment, but if you look at the criminal penalties, civil remedies um, on page 21, starting in sub 5, uh, 21.25, um, and then going immediately to 21.27, um, the sentence reads, the attorney general or an elections official may bring a civil action to prevent restrain or restrain a violation of this section. And um, that, uh, that really bothers me um, that we would have a section here that deals with prior restraint rather than um, uh, accountability for an action that's actually one of intimidation. And I, um, uh, I'm really uncomfortable with that. I don't know of any remedy for it, but I know I don't like it. And um, it, it does not seem that it's like saying, um, you, um, uh, we think you're gonna be a bad person and do bad things, and guess what? We're gonna prevent you from doing it. We're not gonna wait for you to do something um, un unless you know somebody's standing there with a weapon or something and, and you're gonna go after them to, to make them quit um, before they hurt somebody. But I don't think that's exactly what is being talked about here. And um, I have a lot of discomfort with that, that language, even though, unless, I should say it this way, unless someone um, uh, maybe from the Attorney General's office can talk about how that language is used elsewhere. Uh, that would give me some comfort about it being used here. So, Mr. Chairman, um, with that one small amendment, and I have, I still have those other concerns that I don't think were satisfied, um, but I appreciate the attention of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rest, and I think that's a wonderful thing for the Judiciary Committee to take a look at. Uh, Senator Westland, you have a, you have a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know, Senator Limmer, they just dump it all in our committee. <laughs> um, uh, I don't work in the AG's office. I'm not an AG. I, I can only give you, I guess, sort of my interpretation of the Senate arrest is I assume that if uh, they become aware of a plot or a plan to engage in the prohibited behavior, that they would be able to obtain a restraining order of some sort to prevent them from doing that. I don't know that that's prior restraint because I think they would still have to have 
they would still have a burden of proof to show that the, the burden would be on them to show that there was an intent to intimidate or interfere with the voting process. Again, I don't work in the AG's office, but I just re I read it a little bit differently than you did. I just wanted to share that. Yep. Anyone have any other perspectives on this? The Senator Cran. Yeah, I, you know, it does say is committing or intends to commit a prohibited act. Mr. Chair. Senator Bolton. Um, I'm happy, I, no one from the AG's office could be here today, so, and we did um, work on that language with them, so sure, I'm, I'm happy to confirm. It. However, um, one example I might give is um, in Minnesota, um, in a previous election, there was an outside group um, who um, had communicated that they were going to have armed folks around polling places, mm -hmm. and because of that, the attorney general um, went to court and, and you know, was determined that can't be done, and then they didn't come and that didn't happen. Didn't so come. that action yeah. prevented that from happening is one example I might give. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just think we need to be, Mr. Chairman, I think we just need to be um, aware of the power of language in our statutes and what and what exactly that would um, that would mean. And and I don't mind having lots of comfort language or comfort explanations about why that's not prior restraint. Um, uh, and if it is prior restraint, um, it's legal because um, Attorney General's already done it. Mm -hmm. Scared Let's, off a group that was coming to uh, monitor our elections, um, indicating that they were gonna be armed. Well, Senator Rest, uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, is there something that indicates conspiracy there? Well, I, I, um, Mr. Chairman, those are some of my questions about it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. So I'm just, I'm just exploring it, and yeah. as um, a, a non-lawyer person reading some language that we're going to pass, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, I just we are to, forwarding, Senator Russ. We are we are forwarding this I, to I know, to uh, judiciary. So we can we can, Mr. Chairman, we can raise all kinds of questions. Got here my marks about, on there. Yes, about the language that's in front of us. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let me follow up and dig a little deeper on that point. Um, Senator Bolden, if you're stating you have an example of where the Attorney General was successfully able to do that, uh, that means there's some other statute that already gives him authorization for that. So what's the difference between the current authorization that he already has for that now and what's going to be different in this new section, in this new language, uh, what's a new example that we're prohibiting that's not already prohibited in law? Thank you. Senator Bolton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, again, this was language that was worked on with the um, Attorney General's office, and unfortunately they couldn't be here today to speak to that, so that is something I, I will have to check on to confirm. I, that example that I give is something I imagine would fall into that, but as to the specific statute to, you know, that it was under previously, I am happy to look into it, but I, I would have to look into it. Uh, thank you, Senator Matthews, for the question. And I'm gonna ask uh, the council if, uh, for instance, the, uh, um, what we have today about um, interference is that a gross misdemeanor? Because we're, we, are we uh, changing the, uh, the penalty for this? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the interference with registration um, and the other provisions in here are all new and they're all gross misdemeanors. I'm not as familiar with the criminal code. I don't know what uh, this activity could be could be considered a crime under current law, and if so, I don't know what those penalties would be. Um, I'm happy to find that out for the committee, and I'm, I'm sure the Judiciary Committee will also consider that issue. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, Senator Bolton. I would also just add the language does say the Attorney General or an election official, so that, that expansion of it, it's not that it's not just the Attorney General or an election official. Perhaps maybe the difference, but again, I will look into it and confirm. Okay, thank you because I think that is important. But Senator Matthews, you have more 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then in that case, that's not a small policy change, and we should thoroughly make sure that we understand what the implications of that are and make sure that that's exactly doing <clears throat> what we intend for it to do. Like, and I'm not saying I don't have a, a pro or a con view on it right now, except that I recognize that's not a small step. And if that's, we should be very careful and uh, not just read over that, talk about it for a couple minutes, move on and pass it on into law. Uh, that should be an area that we really hone down on and make sure that we understand before uh, this goes forward. In Senator Matthews, I think you're correct. Uh, however, that's probably not within our jurisdiction when you're talking about the violations and the penalties. So that uh, we're going to have to rely on judiciary to catch, to capture that. And, you know, I'll, I'm on that committee, so I'll bring that to the committee, too. Any other questions? And Senator Rust, did you get find your earlier questions so that we can make sure they get answered? Those last two were the ones I, I even remember. Okay. Other, other comments and questions? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Bolden, uh, there's reference to uh, bar corporations from making political contributions in your bill. Do you make other uh, prohibitions for other groups such as labor unions? Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Are you speaking about the portion of the bill that um, doesn't allow foreign influence corporations to make? No, Could domestic you labor unions. Could you give me the line that you're asking about or the section of the bill that you're asking I, about? I'm only asking a question in general, uh, but not specifically. I'm just wondering if other organizations other than corporations are included in your contribution prohibitions. Um, thank you for the question. It, it is the intention and the, the, um, it is geared toward corporations, as you said, yes. Uh, I guess the other question would be is, why not? Why not include other donation sources that represent a large number of people, such as corporations? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, thank you for the question. So, I mean, the intention behind uh, that section, both that section and the um, uh, the section about um, foreign influence corporations is because um, you know, Minnesotans want dark money out of our out of out of our elections. They want to know who is spending money. They they want um, you know the voice of the people to be at the center, not large corporations and folks that they don't know who they are. And so um, that's where we landed with the language with the bill. I, you know, there's room to to discuss. You know, should it look different? Could it? You know, should it? expand to other folks, but, um, you know, at this point, it's, it's aimed at corporations. Okay. Mr. Chair. Senator Grant. Um, to follow up on that question, and, and Senator Bolden, um, would any of those entities, I'm not speaking of the foreign interests, but when we get into the campaign finance issues of the other dark money, and we would, I would love to get rid of all the dark money, because most of it benefits someone other than my party. And so we would love to have confidence that whatever we did would actually do that. So I'm concerned, not with the foreign, we'll leave that one away, apart, but when Senator Limmer uh, made the statement, would other entities, known entities today who make significant contributions and or provide significant express advocacy then fall into the campaign finance area in the, the earlier portion of the bill in, in, in the description or as we roll that out, because it'd be very difficult for us to understand what are those words, what are those actions, and making that something that's pretty clear. And even though an entity may be required to report, as some public unions would be, right, in their dollars, there's a portion, but are there portions of it that are spent that are not being reported and would fall into that express advocacy? And maybe we should take a more thorough review and look at those. There's a lot of Nonprofit corporations in the room that are doing a lot of express advocacy today. Would those things fall into that category? And so that's, I'm kind of worried about 
where that piece of it goes and how we're going to be able to create something that we believe could be applied fairly across the board and, to, and with the entire desire to track all dollars and, and be able to make sure that those that are expressly advocating are, are being required to report and track and file in the campaign finance. So I'm really concerned about how would any of those entities fall into that category? Senator Bolton. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Cran, thank you for the question. So I, I'm not sure I entirely understand your question, but we'll say, um, you know, there's money flowing from big corporations to both parties, to be sure. And um, in terms of the, you know, the expressed advocacy piece, you know, that that's what we're trying to do with this bill is to get to that federal standard because as you know we've shown it, it is very um, gray and you know as I mentioned we're getting in, we're getting an F rating in that right now and so um, you know it would be moving us to the federal standard so that yes everyone would have to comply with that and folks would know where money is coming from and going to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Er, thank you, Senator Bolden. And Mr. Chair, maybe it'd be a good time to, if we're going to go down this line of questioning and, and the portion of the bill on corporate and or express advocacy to bring Mr. Sigurdsson up. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. Thank you, Senator Krent. We are reaching 5 o'clock, and we would like to terminate the, uh, the hearing for today and continue on Tuesday. Um, but we have... Uh, I'd, I'd like to get a little bit further into this uh, and maybe even get uh, Mr. Sigurdsson uh, uh, lined up and teed up to be able to answer this when we get back together. Mr. Chair, I, Senator Krent. I, I would agree with you 100%. From, so I, I think we have a couple amendments. We, we might be able to take care of an amendment um, before we do make a clean slate because I do think there's a larger portion and, and I, don't wanna, I don't want to... Um, uh, not be able to address all those issues very thoroughly because I know Mr. Sigurdsson is going to have uh, plenty of questions and, and a lot of work to do <laughs> based on, on what's in this bill. So I think it will take some time and I think it would be good for those. I will with, withhold those questions until we come back okay. um, to open it up. And, and with that, then, Mr. Chair, I, I, would, uh, I would like to move an amendment. So um, I would like to move okay. um, the A37 amendment to Senate File 3. Mr. Chair, I'd like to apologize for Mr. Sigurdsson for having him come up to the table, and uh, but we'll welcome, we'll see you when we resume. And oh, Senator yeah. Cran, if I might, I would like to uh, take just a moment to hear from Mr. Keller, who has been waiting oh. back there for quite some time. If you can come up and, and give your your uh, testimony. Uh, please limit it as much as possible, and you know you didn't sign up, so we're giving you a, a lot of uh, leeway here. And I'd like you to get it in, get it into a couple of minutes. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your statements. Uh, thank you, Chair, and the Election Senate Election Committee. Today, on February second, twenty twenty-three. Please be real close to the microphone. <laughs> Um, I am a, I'm a white male with a camouflage orange hat, a beard, and t again testifying to the Senate Election Committee on February 2nd, 2023. Uh, uh, I've been uh, working on accessibility for some time at the voting polls. I provided a handout to Mr. Limmer, to you, Chair, as well, uh, and Mr. C uh, Coran. Anyhow, um, First of all, uh, unless the Secretary of State wants to speak, obviously not today, but with time restraints, um, they don't, the, the, the money that they give to the legislature, uh, they can't apply to their web pages, only Pacific pages. Uh, that's problematic. I, I brought this up uh, a few years ago with Mr. Nelson, the chair in house, and Ms. Kiffmeyer. I did a, a five-year data request on myself provided that information as well, so they could look that over. Eventually, uh, Mr. Steve Simon did send a correspondence, which I provided with you today, a few people, which is currently online, uh, asking the Help American Vote Act commissioners, Mr. Hicks and others, currently he's the chair now, on uh, fixing the accessibility of the machines that read out loud at the voting polls. There's many things that are problematic. 
uh, perhaps uh, if anyone wants to sit down and have the discussion with me, I've spoke a few other times with other people that I forward this, this subject data on myself. Uh, it goes back five years. I think it's uh, relevant if, if you want to get this thing uh, headed in the right direction regarding access of the voting polls. I currently have Mr. Mansky in Ramsey County uh, holding out on me to have a discussion. Uh, he's the election, the election manager in Ramsey County with the prior last two elections. I have the B.B. Black, Secretary of State, just met with him last week, last week and getting, you know, definite answer uh, and following up with me. That's the only attorney that they have there that I'm aware of. Once again, I, 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 I get this, I guess, uh, be pretty bewildered uh, with trying to go to the League of Women Voters, Minnesota uh, Disability Law Center, uh, just to name a few that, or I should say, uh, Common, uh, common cause, another one. Uh, no well, one gets back you, to me you on for this. Your, so, anyways, that's that's all I have to add. Thank you today. for your comments. We have but to be I, at the floor on the floor pretty soon here. So, uh, we, Mr. Chair, with that in light of the time, so uh, what I would like to do is withdraw my amendment um, because of the the time temporarily, um, and then um, and then uh, recommend that we table the bill and then resume unless you plan to recess until after floor. <laughs> <laughs> you thank joke. you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, you, I, I withdraw my, uh, my, my amendment. Uh, Senator Cran uh, withdraws his amendment for the time being, and we're gonna, going to table this bill until uh, uh, Tuesday when we're going to pick it back up again, and we'll, you know, Senator Cran will be the, the first person that we go to. Uh, if there's any uh, questions that need to be answered, please provide them to Senator Bolden so that we can get them to either Mr. Sigurdsson or the uh, Attorney General on those questions that we had that were still open. So uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do is adjourn for today. So it is uh, 5 uh, adjourned. <laughs>